Agile really fits in the complex domain. And the difference between the two, complicated and complex, end up being complicated is there's a lot of parts, but there's still a way to do it, right? There's probably good practices, and it's a matter of fixing, picking which one to use, right? In a complex space, that's when you've got change, right? It's not just, I've got all the pieces and parts I have to figure out how to do it. It's it's changing, right? And we don't have all the pieces, and we may never, right? So we got to figure out how to adapt and 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 deal with it. And so that's where Agile really fits in the complex space and all the other spaces, there, there's probably a better answer, a different way to do it. Welcome back everyone to the Geeks, Geezers and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Cochran. Welcome back for another episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. I'm Ira Wolf. And I'm Jason Cochran. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We're the voice of the most important conversations on the future of work that's confronting business leaders and people today. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the ever-changing convergence of business, technology, and people. Hey, Jason, as you can imagine, my mind has been working overtime in anticipation of today's conversation. For me, today's show could, is the equivalent of Muhammad Ali and Joe Fraser, Rocky and Apollo Creed, uh, your legendary battles between Colts, Peyton Manning, and Patriots, Tom Brady. Because Ooh. today, we're going to be talking about agility versus adaptability. But unlike those fierce competitors in the ring and on the field, uh, many times they became collaborators later in life. Uh, and so by the end of the show, we intend to show how it's not just adaptability or agility that organizations need and people need, but adaptability and agility versus the change that's happening and how together adaptability and agility can be the champions and the superpowers of tomorrow. But while anticipating how to approach this conversation this week, uh, and it's still only Wednesday, I've seen a deluge of perfect storylines. And one of those that really stood out was yesterday. I received an email from Statista. Uh, it's S-T-A-T-I-S-T-A. -T -T if you're not familiar with it, look it up. They, they always have great stories, uh, great demographics, uh, great graphs. Their headline read, smartphones wipe out decades of camera industry growth. So with the exception of any Gen Z listeners, uh, anyone else listening to the podcast probably remembers only a camera that required film. And that film was probably manufactured by Kodak, and your pictures were likely pro uh, processed with Kodak chemicals. By the year 2000, over 30 million film cameras were sold each year. And Kodak film industry was around for nearly 100 years, and management apparently and naively thought the future was only coming, that it wasn't here yet. Then one day, cameras didn't need film anymore, which meant they didn't need those chemicals either. So beginning in the late 1990s, uh, which is crazy just about 30 years ago, digital cameras began, began to replace film cameras and sales skyrocketed to over 120 million shipped every year. But here's the thing, the popularity of digital cameras lasted just over a decade while film cameras lasted over a century. Between 2010 and 2022, worldwide camera shipments dropped 93%. Shipments of cameras with built-in lenses, and you're probably familiar with some of these companies like Olympus, Canon, and Nikon, dropped from 110 million sales a year to 2 million in just 12 years. So it's, it's not that people aren't taking pictures anymore, because it's estimated that there's over 5 billion photos taken every day, and the average person takes 22 pictures, photos daily as well. What are they using? Smartphones. Maybe the headline should have read, smartphones crush a century of camera industry growth. But now I can go on and on and talk about industries that don't exist and iconic businesses that no longer exist. Um, Sears, Woolworths, Oldsmobile, Compaq, Blockbuster, 
Um, any Gen Z probably has no idea what I'm talking about, but that's <laughs> not the story here. Management of these companies might argue that they were changing. Many of us might even agree that they were changing. They had great strategic plans, but herein lies the problem. They just weren't changing fast enough. And that's exactly what's happening today. I can't tell you how many times, and we've heard this on the show and from other people, but I know you have hear it too, Jason. We hear from business leaders that they're working on really aggressive plans for 2024 and beyond. But here's the thing. The deadline for disruptive and radical transformation in many industries, especially with uh, AI, has passed. Time is, off, is the enemy. It's not your friend. Change and progress don't wait for laggards to catch up. And you can't keep up with the pace of change with yesterday's skills and mindset. It requires agile leadership and an adaptive mindset, or as I tend to call it and my, co my colleagues, adaptability quotient. And with all that said, you will see why Jason and I are delighted to welcome Aaron Copel, CEO and founder of Project Brilliant, to the show today. We're going to tackle this question. What must companies do to prevent their best product or service from becoming the next camera, the next Sears, the next blockbuster? But before we get to Aaron, it's time for the perfect labor story. This is where I get to the point, I get to point out a disruptive, surprising, or worrisome trend that we believe you should know. And this is perfect timing for today's show because just minutes before the, the show went on, I participated in a webinar sponsored by uh, ProSci. And they shared expected management trends in the next coming five years. Topping the list is converging people, culture, and strategy. In 2019, this was at the bottom of the top priority list. The next was, the, and this is current, the next was a, adopting Agile, This drop, which is good news for Aaron. This adopt, although this dropped to number two slot, it's still... Uh, a high, high top priority. And then these were curious, increasing awareness of the need for change management. It's it's number three, which is good, but I'm not sure why it's still on the list. Why do we need to increase awareness for the need for change? Uh, leveraging technology was four, which is also curious. That's the same as 2019, um, despite the fact that, you know, with, with the growth of AI, uh, building organizational capacity jumped from number five to the top spot because it was sharing that uh, comparing with converging people, culture and strategy. And integrating project management into into a change management fell from the top spot in 2015 to dead last in 2023. And let me close with this. This message literally just flashed on my screen just a second ago. I have to read what it's about, but it says information from three months ago is obsolete today. All right. It begs the question, how fast is too fast? When we talk about adaptability and accelerating change all the time on the show, but what's happening right now is really intriguing. And the only thing I want to add on to this before we bring Aaron on is what happened just a couple of weeks ago with the tumultuous weekend at OpenAI, the parent company of ChatGPT, where the CEO, Sam Altman, was unexpectedly fired by the board. And then 72 hours later, he was rehired and the board was fired. What the heck was going on there? Well, some things are starting to come out to light here. And, and what was brought to the surface is that the fight that was going on internally right now in that company, but it's also a microcosm of what's going on around the world is we've got folks who are, are kind of called accelerationists. They want to push AI and advancement forward as fast as possible. And then we have folks on the other end that uh, are maybe more of the cautious optimists who want to slow this down and keep the advancements safer. And it appears the new board is going to be more balanced and in favor of some checks and balances that weren't necessarily there before to help keep Altman in check as he can be known to play fast and loose with safety, according to some of his critics. And this is all just kind of a, a microcosm of the intersection that we find ourselves at right now with AI as it quickly becomes more integrated into our world and is already changing so much of what we've known.
couple examples in addition to what you were sharing, Ira, about how much change has happened with cameras. Listen to this with, with AI. AstraZeneca right now is already using AI to create anti-cancer antibodies to cure cancer. And just last week, Google DeepMind researchers reported that their AI model discovered, listen to this, their AI model discovered last week 381,000 stable new materials for scientists to make and test in a lab. And it did it just like that. With all this exciting change going on right now around us, we've got to upgrade our human operating systems to adopt agile and adaptive mindsets so that we aren't left behind. And uh, just as the legendary Doc Brown said in Back to the Future 2, Marty, where we're going, we don't need roads. To help us learn more about what all of this means and how we can thrive through all of this change, we're thrilled to have Aaron Kopel with us, the CEO and founder of Project Brilliant. So without further ado, let's bring him on. Let's give him a warm Googleization nation to Aaron Kopel. As you heard, we got a lot to talk about with you. So we're going to hit the ground running here. But let's start with this question before we get in deep. Tell us about you and how did you become such an expert in agile leadership development? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks, Ira. Thanks, Jason, for having me. Uh, it's uh, exciting. I'm so glad we have about six hours to talk about all this stuff because there's so much to cover. <laughs> <Right>? so. <laughs> um, so for, for me, yeah, so I um, uh, long, long ago founded a couple of startup companies, tech startups, uh, unfortunately did not become Zuckerberg, but but learned a lot about uh, that sort of mindset. Uh, you know, being a startup, really having to focus on, on customer needs and, and be able to deliver and adapt uh, as you went. And so uh, even though those startups were not successful, learned a lot about uh, about that mindset and then how to take action with that, and then uh, essentially started helping apply that mindset to larger companies, right? And so some of my first uh, agile coaching uh, opportunities were with some large uh, large companies like in the pharma space, uh, fintech, banking, things like that. And so so bringing that startup kind of mindset uh, of innovation, adaptability, those kind of things to to, to bear, and that's really. Uh, you know, my, my entry point into Agile and then with leadership development, it was really helping leaders understand how to guide the organization with that mindset. So that's kind of the background for me. Perfect. And we're going to be getting into some some terminology that maybe for some folks they've heard before, but they don't have a clear understanding or definition of it today. So again, before we get into deep, can you kind of just set the table for us when you're talking about Agile methodology or Agile leadership development? Can you kind of help clearly define those terms for us and for our listeners so that we've got a good understanding before we dive deep into these subjects? Yeah, sure thing. So the the definition of Agile that we, we typically use for us, uh, and, and a lot of this comes from the, the software development world, of course, uh, but for us, Agile is a mindset uh, that we think about uh, delivering value iteratively, incrementally, um, and, and doing that collaboratively. So it's really a, uh, about those kind of things, the mindset of iterative incremental development, delivering value, collaborating, and then ultimately continuously improving. So it's a lot of, you know, what you guys were referring to is, is just really keeping up and, and trying to improve all the time because things are always changing and advancing and it's really keeping up with that. And so that, that kind of definition of Agile, then you apply that to leadership and it's really, you know, getting into that mindset and how do you guide the organization? How do you manage people? How do you deal with uh, change in general with that mindset as a leader? Uh, and so, you know, you can't lock things in and, and have big plans, long time horizons uh, where, where things aren't going to change. We just know that's not happening anymore. Right. And so so as a leader, it's really taking that mindset to heart, starting to shift our behaviors uh, and really, really applying that to everything we do as a leader. Right? So, and, and Aaron, and I, I, we talked a little bit about this before the show, So I want to be able to talk about the difference between adaptability because that's where I focus. So we talk about, mm -hmm. about adaptability and agile fits into that. And you're talking about uh, adapt, uh, agile. And I know you talk about adaptability fits into that model. So mm -hmm. it's got a chicken or the egg here. Um, from I, I watched a number of your videos and I, I recommend people go up to you, the website and um, and, and look at those um, because many of them are, are, are free. Uh, the what I got out of it was that Agile was really a process, a model, a method, uh, and a strategy. But in order for Agile to be effective and successful, people need to be adaptable. Yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. And, and I think that uh, you know, we, we usually promote Agile as a mindset. And there's a lot of stuff that people know about Agile that's probably more of the you know, practices or, or process side of it, which you know, a lot of people associate with Agile, like things like a daily stand-up, for example, like you know, every day, let's get together uh, and plan out our work for the day, understand where we are and, and you know, understand how to collaborate and be effective today. There, there's some, you know, some of those kind of things that people have picked up along the way in terms of practices and process. We usually try to promote really that that mindset of agility. And you know, when I when I hear adaptability and agility, they're very closely related, and, and a lot of people use those, you know, synonymously. I think there is a difference though. And um, you know, I'd love to hear your your thoughts on it too. But my when I hear that, my my initial reaction to it is, well, I think adaptable to me is kind of more going with the flow, right? So you're adapting to things, to circumstances, things like that. And agility, the the slight difference I see with that, the way at least the way we promote it, is it's that plus taking action, right? So you're 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 adapting, understanding what's changing, you're getting feedback and understanding where opportunities might be. But for us, we we promote a lot of that with take action, right? So so instigate something, do something, and then you're going to learn from that, and then do the next thing. And so you know they they really do seem very complementary and very closely related. So you know, I'd love to hear you know your your take on that as well. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And we talked a little bit about this right before the show. So when we talk about it, it's more we're, we're talking more about uh, an AQ. I mean, adaptability, and, and and we use AQ and 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 adaptability quotient or adaptability uh, again so synonymously. We interchange those, uh, but we're focused on the person. So in order to, to to make agile work, not only from a leadership standpoint, but to to get frontline workers and the people that are going to integrate this. Everybody needs to be have have this adaptive have this mindset be adaptable, but it takes skills. So we look at this ACE model, and the ACE model looks at uh, the abilities, and people are familiar with some of them, and, uh, and I'm sure this is discussed in Agile too. You can confirm this or or deny. It. But we talk about grit. You know, people need to be gritty. They have to have grit. They have to have resilience. Um, they need a growth mindset to, to be open to new ideas. Um, they have to have mental flexibility because we live in this VUCA world, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Ambiguous means that sometimes there's there's not an answer. There's different options, and we have to right. choose those options. And people always want to know, well, which one? And and especially in the HR world, is that they're so attuned to best practices. Well, yeah. we're going to pull that one off the shelf because it worked for another company, but the circumstances were completely different. And it's like, which of those 10 best practices might work in, in our environment? Yeah. So that takes change. And then we, we look at unlearning. Not we, we all recognize that we need to keep learning, but we also need to unlearn, which isn't really a thing. But we need to, 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 to figure out a way that new habits overcome the old yeah. habits in order to do that. And then we look at character, which is the C, which I won't go into a great detail, but that's basically how does our personality impact that? But we then we look at the culture and we look at how how well is company is the company functioning, uh, company management uh, dealing with the change? Do they, do they create, does management itself create a supportive environment? Um, how does the team and the manager, the coworkers, is that does that support change? Uh, and so if you if you're if you have an, an agile initiative, everybody buys into it. Well, the company has, you know, it, it has to be at the top. Is there support and belief at that level? And then the next level down to the team. And then what are the work policies, which I think and to me, that's really where agile can help change the policies and the processes in there. Uh, and then we get into measuring the well-being of uh, psychological safety. Is it okay to change? Because going from where they are, whatever whatever method that they want to use, if it's agile or some other method, lean, six sigma, there's change involved. People are going to make mistakes. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, and then it looks at this job stress. So it looks at this comprehensively, but it all focuses on the person. Mm -hmm. it's, so when we talk about adaptability, it's more, are the people adaptable? And I'm almost thinking agile is, is the organization yeah. agile enough, but in order to make that happen, you need adaptable people. So, yeah. And I, so I think they're, you know, very complimentary, maybe even a hand in glove here, because I, I think, uh, you know, a big part of agile, as we think about this is, is going to be team-based, right? So every, we try to do everything in a team-based manner. So you're getting cross-functional skills and things together. And so it starts with teams, but then it's teams of teams and then, you know, expands to the whole organization. So 
So yeah, maybe it's that, you know, people having that adaptive mindset. And then as we apply that to groups trying to get work done together, they form teams and it really becomes, you know, the, the, the ideal for us is that the whole organization becomes agile, meaning they, they operate almost like a, a living organism where they can adapt to change together uh, as a company, right? So we think about that, like in some examples we use sometimes are, you know, some of the traditional companies we, we come across are maybe more like, you know, a large Titanic type ship or like an oil tanker or something like that. They're, they're big and they're they're moving in a direction. It's hard to, to shift or, or go, you know, in a, in a different direction or, or pivot. And as we think about that with an agile approach, what we want to do is think about this much more as like a fleet of speedboats, right? That we can we can adapt and, and move as a, you know, almost like a school of fish kind of thing, right? Uh, so we're going in a direction, but we're going together and, and it's all complementary, but it's all about teams and people working together to try to accomplish common goals, things like that. So, so, so Aaron, we don't want you to give away your, we don't want you to give away <laughs> your trade secrets, but how do, how do we do that? So I love that, that illustration you just gave of kind of like a school of fish, like, okay, we're all going to move this direction. Um, what's the the magic behind agile and the methodology and the things that you do that help organizations start not just thinking that way, but you use the term behavior. How do they start behaving that way? What are some of the ingredients that have, have got to be in there? Yeah, so I think, you know, there, there's several pieces, of course, but I, I think, you know, some big things that come to mind as you guys were talking in the lead into the show, a lot about change management. And so, you know, with, with effective change management, you know, there's, there's things like uh, self-awareness of where are we, where do we want to go, uh, and, and what kind of things need to change for us individually, but also as a, as a team and as an organization. Um, you know, having common goals is really helpful. So there's certainly good techniques for that out there. You know, I'm sure lots of your uh, listeners have heard of OKRs and, and similar things like that to try to align on common goals and common direction, right? Having that leadership kind of vision of where we're going. And I think for us, the, the stuff that we run into pretty often is, is really those leadership behaviors, right? Um, and so, so the, the posters you can see behind me for those watching, uh, some remnants from a leadership class that I teach. And, and one of those is this model called leadership agility uh, from Bill Joyner and Stephen Josephs and uh, that we've adapted from uh, some friends of ours at uh, Agile Leadership Journey. And it, it really is a progression of, of development for leaders going from people who are experts in a job and they can manage people in the job, then people who are good at achieving bigger goals where they can organize and motivate people in, in different disciplines. And we try to take that to the next level, which is becoming a catalyst leader where they're able to, to sort of see that longer term vision. They're very self-aware uh, of how they're coming across and how they're guiding the organization and how to, how to accept feedback. And then really thinking about the organization uh, in a broader sense, like the, the ecosystem in which the organization lives. It's not just about you know, one team or one department or even our company. It's about the whole ecosystem in which the company lives. And if you start thinking that way, you know, it's a bigger perspective. It's understanding the longer term time horizon where things need to, to take shape. And, and really, I think from a leadership standpoint, it's, it's having that kind of approach. Uh, even if you are operating in a more tactical day to day kind of a role, you can still have that kind of a mindset about thinking about the bigger picture, thinking about the why behind things you do and how those will connect the dots to the future. And I think that's uh, a lot of what we try to help individuals uh, sort of adopt that mindset, and the behaviors that come with that so that they can be effective in guiding teams, guiding you know, business units or organizations through change. And so there, there's a lot that comes with that. And, it, and it's, of course, really hard, but but it's a lot about that change management kind of stuff. So it was really interesting to hear that, you know, that uh, the change management one sort of dropped on the list, but it's still there. And I think part of the reason it's there is people people hear the term change management. They don't fully understand it, but they think they've checked the box already and they want to move on and do something else. Right. But that's just something that's got to keep going on. Right. Um, you know, we run into a lot of companies where, where their, you know, quote, change management function is, oh, it's that one guy that sends the emails out. Like, <laughs> that's not change management, right? <laughs> yeah, the weird guy in the corner that comes up with all these ideas that we, we allow yeah. out every <laughs> once in a while. Uh, so it, it, the, your, your graphic behind you is really, really interesting, what you walk through. So I, I noticed that the, the expert and the achiever are uh, heroic. Mm, yeah. yeah and, 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 and so the, to me, Explain that to me, because I, I yeah, would have yeah. thought that the catalyst, that the, the, the disruptor may, may actually be the hero. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, so it's interesting. We, we try to, um, so let me just, I guess, explain what we mean by heroic. It's really, 
you know, if you're you're an expert leader, you're you're someone who's in the management role because you're an expert in a discipline. So for us, we talk a lot about, for example, you're a software developer, you get promoted to be the manager of the software developers, and the reason you got promoted because you're good at it, right? You understand how it works. You can you can help those people directly understand how to do their jobs. So you're an expert in that thing, and they're heroic in the fact that they can take all the burden on their shoulders. And if you know their person that they're they're uh, that reports to them is struggling, they can jump in and you know put their hands on the keyboard and do the job for them. And so they can jump in and be the hero if they need to be. Uh, the achiever leader is also heroic, but from a different perspective. It's not so much they can jump in and do all the work, but they're heroic from the fact that they can come up with the best idea and rally people to the cause and motivate them and you know get morale going and all that kind of stuff and sort of be that rah rah you know kind of kind of person at the town hall getting everyone excited. And it's heroic from the fact that they're the ones sort of holding up the tent poles, getting all the political capital in place to, to get budget and, and buy in for this initiative that they've started, things like that. And the, the danger, though, with those heroic kind of behaviors is if that person goes away for whatever reason, like they leave the company or they get sick or whatever happens, right, that hero goes away, it all collapses, right? There's no one left holding up the tent poles. And so what we want to do is go beyond that to what we call post-heroic, which is that this leader is operating from a place where it doesn't have to be all about them. They don't have to be able to do the work. They they're not, it doesn't have to be the one coming up with the best idea. It's about them creating an environment where everyone can participate and collaborate and come up with shared ideas and things like that. So it's sort of a, it would call post heroics. You're going beyond just the need for that one individual to either do the work or have the best ideas. It's about all of us being successful together, not relying on one person who can, you know, ultimately if they they collapse if that you know link in the chain breaks, it all falls apart. So we want to go beyond that. Right. Yeah, Aaron, is it fits so well that your your model and it, and again another uh, linkage to our uh, ACE model and the adaptability. So when we we can create a, a team report for the AQ, mm -hmm. and it looks at globally where does people fit in, and there's two additional scales that I just love. Uh, one is explore and transform, which are the disruptors, uh, and that seems to align with the catalysts. The, the visionaries, the, the people yeah. that are going to be able to do that. Uh, and then there um, is the utilize and improve. So those are, that's a continuous improvement, constantly making improvements, but it's not changing the world. It's not Steve Jobs. It's not disrupting an entire industry. It's making those incremental improvements on the process, which also, and both of these fit under agile, uh, both of them fit under adaptability. So your, your, your model tends to align with the people side and we're more focused on how do you get people to not only willing to adapt, because many people are willing, but able to yeah. make those changes because they're going to make mistakes. Uh, and people who don't have the confidence or they don't have a great manager or they're learning a new skill. Um, there's this great um, video that's out there. I, I don't know if you've seen it about the backward bicycle. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah. For those who don't know, look up backward bicycle. I, I don't, rem I can't remember the individual who did it, but it's tremendous because it it literally says is how you can retrain yourself, how you can learn a new skill, and how it's easier if you're younger, but it's not impossible if you're older uh, to be able to do these things. Um, but it fits in into this explore, um, explore and transform versus utilize uh, and improve. Uh, and so, as soon as I I see your diagram back there. Um, you know, it really fits into that because the experts uh, are not going to be the visionaries. They're they're not going to change the world. Um, yeah. They're unlikely to come up with the new product, but they're you, you need them. Crucial, yeah, yeah, yeah. crucial, right? You got to get work done, right? So yeah. So yeah, I yeah. often get asked, you know, on my side, is which one's better? I mean, should you have more explore and transform, or you less improve it? It depends what industry you're in, what business. If you're in tech and rely on AI, you better have a, a, a higher proportion in explore and transform um, than you do if you're in you know, a, another yeah. industry that is, is not being affected as quickly. Yeah. Um, and certainly you know, like functional areas too can, can matter there. Like, I'm not sure I need my accountant to be a, a super visionary. I want them to actually just get the numbers right, you know, stuff like that. So yeah, yeah there's, there's different industries, different disciplines and functions inside companies to, the, to consider there. Yeah. Well, we're, we're just getting started here, I think. We're just warmed up. And as I said, so fortunately, we're in the first half hour or six hour show. No, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately that's not the case. Uh, we're, and uh, we're, we're going to, but we're going to take a real quick break here because we definitely want to continue this and get back. 
uh, and be talking about agility and adaptability. And I know Jason's jumping at the bit. He's got a question to ask. But we want to thank everybody for listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. We're here with uh, Aaron Kopel uh, from Pro uh, Brilliant Project. Uh, we're talking about adaptability and agility or agility and adaptability uh, and how they mix and how they support one another. Uh, we will be right back in one minute. Are your employees feeling stuck and just showing up for a paycheck? Is your workforce working harder to get back to normal than adapting to the future? It's time to help them break their addiction to certainty and develop a growth mindset. Developed by one of the world's top-rated future of work thought leaders, AQ Plus Mindset is a powerful tool to help your employees embrace change, adapt faster, and grow on the job. Conveniently delivered to any smartphone or laptop and easy to digest 5-10 to 10 minute lessons. Managers can sit back and watch employee attitude shift towards growth and innovation in just 30 days. Are you ready to help your employees thrive in this ever-changing, never-normal world? Encourage them to show more grit, resilience, adaptability, and unlock their potential? The journey to a growth-filled future starts with a growth mindset. Visit aqplusmindset.com or call 484-373-4300. Hey, welcome back, everyone. You're watching our listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. We're here with Aaron Kopel from uh, Brilliant Project. And, or, yeah, Brilliant, Brilliant Project. I keep uh, mixing those two up. Um, Jason, you had a question. I do. And it's a big one. A <laughs> it's it's a big one here. You could see on my face, Aaron, that I was ready for this one. I wanted to ask Aaron. So, Aaron, you heard at the beginning, Ira and I were talking about AI and I know we can we can often dabble in some hyperbole, but I don't think it's hyperbole when we say AI is the most disruptive change in the history of the world already with what it's doing and what it's going to become. With that, and the work that you're doing around agile leadership development, is AI starting to impact that work in any way? Or what do you foresee it? impacting the work that you're doing with organizations on becoming agile and adaptable yeah for, for sure i mean it's i think it's uh hard to find an industry or discipline that it's it's not impacting um and, and certainly what we see with uh you know agile organizations and, and leaders in particular uh it's certainly starting to to have an impact there right uh and i think the the challenge like like most uh people initially think about ai it's like oh it's going to take all the jobs of everyone right uh, and think, think about the negative side of that maybe, but I think it's really, you know, where, where we've started to land is really this is an enabler, right? It's, it's something that can help us and and promote uh, more effectiveness and, you know, maybe take some of those uh, more tactical or, or, or repetitive kind of things off their plate uh, where they can, you know, really have more, more opportunity, more capacity towards the things that really need their brain power um, and, 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 and you know, more adaptability from them personally to be able to lead the organization, to do the people side of things, right? And that's a lot of what we have been promoting with leaders for a long time anyway, is, you know, get out of the, the work, right? And really get more into people development and, and really empowering and enabling your people to be more effective and and really helping to them, them to develop and grow. And, you know, so a lot of stuff uh, Ira mentioned already with, with the um, uh, AQ model, I think it's very, you know, very much in line with what we uh, teach and, and talk to leaders about as we, we train and coach them. And so I think AI is is really an enabler for them to be able to focus more on those kinds of things and, and leave the, you know, a lot of that tactical stuff or the things that, you know, might take them hours and hours to, you know, build PowerPoint slides, for example, right? I find a lot of leaders where that's like half their day every day is just like update the PowerPoint slides, create new PowerPoint slides, you know, just deck after deck after deck. And there's a lot of things that can, you know, AI can use to get that off their plate so they can focus on the things that actually matter. And so that that's just one example of a lot of things that are probably coming. And, you know, I, I think as we go towards the future, there's a lot more uh, of those kind of, you know, the, the sort of tactical things that they can start taking off their plate and, and get more time for the, the people side of things. Well, and you're a catalyst. You like to tinker with things. So I'm curious for you, have you been dabbling in oh, AI yeah. and, and the work that you're doing with clients? Cool. So what's some of the stuff that you're doing? Yeah, certainly, uh, you know, as we, we think about the, the obvious stuff, you know, ChatGPT can do all kinds of wonderful things in terms of, uh, you know, content creation or or uh, asking it questions and trying to get, you know, starting points for answers for things. So so we, we've uh, looked at that with clients to try to help enable them. 
uh, on our side. You know, there's some things for just, you know, marketing purposes and that kind of stuff, obviously, as a uh, consulting business, as we're putting out content, things like that, that's helpful and interesting. But, you know, I think there's there's a lot more to it. And I, I think for us, thinking about how does that uh, impact the world for us in terms of training and coaching, that's a, a big part of our business. And so, you know, we do a lot of creative and unique things in training, uh, especially in, in person classes, like you can see some of the stuff behind me, these are all like, you know, live drawings that we do, uh, even virtually in our classes. But, you know, so it's not going to take over that necessarily, but it's it could be a good enabler in terms of how do we prepare people to come to class more aware of what we're going to talk about so we can have better conversations in our training classes, for example. And so they're not starting at zero, they're starting at 10 or 20, right? Uh, in, in terms of percent of understanding what we're going to cover so that we can get deeper, we can talk about their specific scenarios and that kind of stuff. So we can sort of, you know, get through the one-on-one stuff a little bit better and easier for them. And it, it might make more sense for them. And then we get into the more interesting conversations. From a coaching standpoint, uh, we're starting to see things pop up. They're not great yet, but I think they're going to get there, uh, which is just coaching tools, right? AI coaching tools. A lot of what coaching is, is asking the right question, right? Asking those provocative, hard questions of people to start getting them thinking, right? So coaches don't have the answer, but they can help you find the answer, right? And I think AI will start to take over, you know, at least a lot of the basic level of that, right? There might be some deeper things or maybe contextual things that that individuals with expertise still need to do, but eventually, you know, that, that's, that stuff is going to uh, diminish by a lot, right? So just like I was talking about with the, uh, the decline of like cameras and things like that, like the market gets disrupted. So things like that, coaching and training, I think, you know, AI is uh, going to enable a lot of that. Uh, but also take you know some of those things off our plate in terms of tactical parts. And from your perspective, now, granted, this is going to be skewed because most of the executive leaders and organizations you're working with, they're already open to kind of this mindset because this mm -hmm. is what you specialize in and is helping change. But I'm curious, are you starting to see more executive leaders say, we're not fearful of this stuff? I'm going to get my hands dirty and I'm going to start tinkering with it and use it in some ways too. Are you seeing any of them take some bold steps of trying to use, I know you mentioned kind of like some PowerPoint decks, any other cool ways that you're seeing senior leaders start to model getting comfortable with using some of these new technologies? Yeah, I, uh, yes. And I, I think some of it is uh, they don't want to be left behind. I mean, they, they realize this is this is the way of the future and they're starting to see a lot of their people take advantage of these tools, right? And I think initially it was, you know, there was sort of some hesitancy by people to use these tools because it felt like, oh, I'm not really doing my job. I'm getting paid to, you know, sit here and hold down this chair and type. Well, no, you're really getting paid to think and solve problems, right? And if this can help you solve problems better and faster and easier, great, right? That's awesome. And so now you can solve more problems and maybe solve them better. And so I think leaders are recognizing that and I think they want to be role models for that as well. So so really promoting this with their people and, and saying, yes, it's okay. It's not just okay. We should use these tools. Otherwise, we're going to be left behind because everyone else is going to use them. And so really from a leadership standpoint, uh, you know, being role models for that and, and really spending some time investigating and researching what are the other tools. So I see lots of leaders looking for, you know, webinars for AI in whatever you know, discipline or function or, or industry uh, out there just trying to learn, 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 which is a great sign. Right. So so I, I find, you know, there's been a lot of leaders who sort of have, have risen to a certain point and then they rest on their laurels because they feel like they're, you know, they built up the expertise. Uh, now I'm just going to use that expertise and just sort of milk it, right? Uh, and I think they're finding that they they can't do that as much as they used to. They really need to continue to learn and continue to advance and, and find that next plateau. And I think a, a lot of these AI tools can help them get there. I think they're also discovering it's not just chat GPT, just go, you know, type in a question, get an answer. It's a lot of other things, you know, there, there's all kinds of uh, ways AI can be used. I'm going to send it back over to I real quick, but I just got to make one comment about what you said, Aaron. I think you just gave the title of your book that you're going to write <laughs> and it's you're getting paid to think and solve problems. <laughs> Literally everyone, everyone, that is your job, regardless of your role or title, you're solving problems for customers, you're solving problems internally in your organization. Absolutely love that, Aaron. Yeah, great. Yeah, I actually take it one step further. Um, and this was from uh, Bob Johansson from the Institute of Future at Work. You know, he said in the future, there will be no problems to solve. There's just <laughs> dilemmas. And that's what people struggle with. And we talked about that before with options is, is people, people want a clear choice. It's, it's binary. It's what, what, you know, it's A or B. And, yeah. and the problem is, is it's C, D, E or F <laughs> as well. And it depends on your circumstances. So it, it, it gets more complicated and people, people hate that. Uh, Aaron, 
so there, there are obviously people, Agile has been around for a while, uh, for decades. And so mm -hmm. people are familiar with it and certainly leaders are familiar with it. Um, why is, are there times when it's not appropriate? And, and and beyond just hey we're not ready for it yet i mean you, you may recognize yeah. that people say hey we we put on agile for the list can you come in and do some training so get that they're they're not <laughs> ready as an organization but are yeah. are there circumstances where agile isn't the right fit at that time yeah yeah definitely so that's that's something we talk with our clients about uh up front when we when we engage with them is you know, what, what are the problems you're sol trying to solve? What are the issues you're having? What challenges are you facing? And, and let's talk about those, right? And so uh, there's some pretty good models out there. The, the most popular one we refer to uh, is called the Kinevin Framework from David Snowden. Um, and it's uh, really talking about the different types of problems you might find, which is simple problems, complicated, complex, and chaos, right? The, those kind of categories you can be in. And so uh, in chaos, right, when everything is up in the air, we're not, we're not sure what's going on, then, then it's kind of just a, uh, you know, do what makes sense to try to get out of chaos, right? There's not really a, a recipe for that. On the simple side, right, the other end of the spectrum, that's where you can just have a checklist and just, you know, repeat the process over and over again. And that's, you know, you can come up with best practices and, and uh, process procedures and all that kind of stuff and, and be successful, right? Because it's the same thing every time and we're, we don't nearly need to adapt. It's just execute efficiently. And that's where things like Lean Six Sigma and, and those kind of uh, frameworks and tools fit really well, right? We're trying to be repeatable, low defect rates and all that kind of stuff. That's simple problem space. The more interesting ones are we get into complicated and complex. And so uh, Agile really fits in the complex domain. And the difference between the two, complicated and complex, end up being complicated is there's a lot of parts, but there's still a way to do it, right? There's probably good practices and it's a matter of fixing, picking which one to use, right? In a complex space, that's when you've got change, right? It's not just, I've got all the pieces and parts I have to figure out how to do it. It's it's changing, right? And we don't have all the pieces and we may never, right? So we've got to figure out how to adapt and, and, and deal with it. And so that's where Agile really fits in the complex space and all the other spaces, there, there's probably a better answer, a different way to do it. And so uh, in a complicated space, you know, there's there's things uh, and tools that often like, times we'll, we'll recommend more of like a lean approach uh, something like that. Waterfall can work in simple places, uh, simple, um, simple problem spaces. And so, yeah, when we talk with our clients, Agile is not the silver bullet. It's not for everything, but let's use it where it makes sense. And that's when things are changing rapidly and we need to be able to adapt and pivot and take action and things like that. Um, and so kind of, you know, we, we go through some examples in our class and give different scenarios or different examples of types of problems. And it's really interesting to see people try to categorize those and come to some realizations like, uh, for example, one of the things we will say is, well, where does like doing knee surgery fit? And we say, well, yeah, it sounds like it's you know difficult, but if you go to medical school and study and, and become a surgeon, like that's pretty straightforward, actually, right? You understand how to fix knees and there's only so many parts in it. And it's really more of a complicated thing. Uh, it's just about deeper learning and but there's there's patterns and there's a, a handful of different maybe approaches to that, but it, it's it's something you can solve if you have the understanding versus a complex space, I always say is anything to do with people because people are strange creatures. They do things like change their mind, right? <laughs> and they get emotional and they, they have stuff go on in their lives and that impacts what they do. And, and that's the kind of stuff with, you know, when we point to a complex situation, right? Anything to do with people is gonna have that component to it because they, they can change their mind, they can get influenced, they can, you know, have reactions that you may not expect. And that's when you have to be able to pivot and adapt and all those things. It, it, it's interesting coming from healthcare and having been in that environment i will guarantee you that every orthopedic surgeon every resident every physician will say no no you obviously don't understand how complex <laughs> a knee surgery is obviously uh, there's all these variables and and yeah. so maybe sometimes maybe the the worst people to ask uh if it's complex or complicated or simple uh is is the expert or the <laughs> is the professional doing it uh where, where you need an outside look at it is i, I know everybody that says you don't understand my business it's really much more complicated or more complex than that uh, but sometimes by taking a a, a, a step back it, yeah. it's not they they overcomplicate it <laughs> and make yeah, it very sure. complex you ask at the beginning what the show was like it's obviously a conversation and i can't believe how far into this we are but we, we're coming toward the end so there's always one question i like to ask uh before we wrap up this segment uh and it and it's was there something that we should have asked you that we didn't or you wanted to cover 
that we didn't. Um, I think you guys have done a great job, and it's, it's been a pleasure being on the show. I think the, the one thing that I, I usually like to stress that we touched on, but uh, you know, maybe is worth a just reiteration, is, is really that change management part of it, right? So you know, that's something I already referred to coming in with some statistics. And I think that's, again, just something that's really overlooked and misunderstood. And I think it's a, a key skill for leaders, right, to, to be able to understand effective change management and, and, you know, as you guide people through change, really understanding, uh, you know, people move at different speeds and they, again, they're complex animals where, where they've got different reactions of things you may not expect. And it's really being prepared as a leader to, to be able to be on your toes and, and, and respond to those things uh, in an effective way that, you know, helps people come along. And, and in every change endeavor, right, there's some people that just aren't going to come along for, for a variety of reasons, but you want to help the bulk of people try to attach to, to the, the change and really help them effectively come through it. And I think that's a, just an underlooked skill for leaders. And I, but I think that's one of the most important things for them going into the future uh, is really being able to not just be visionary and self-aware and those kind of things, but really build up that muscle of effective change management, like the people side of that, as well as understanding how to help people connect to strategy and things like that. And I, I think it's just something we run into a lot in organizations. Like I said, I kind of half jokingly said, you know, oftentimes people point to the change management person, quote, change management person as the guy that sends the emails, right? Uh, that has, you know, that's like maybe the tactical part you might see, but that's not really change management, right? It's it, it's much more about understanding people and motivations and how to help them along. And I think that's, you know, again, just building that muscle, like is just really crucial for the future. Brilliant, Aaron. And we've come to our next segment. We are going to do the lightning round now. So, it's time to get to know you a little bit more on a personal level and help our listeners do the same. So I've got four questions for you here. Hopefully they'll be pretty easy, Aaron, but we awesome. want to get to know you a little bit better here. So let's start with this one. Who's your favorite band or maybe a favorite song? Oh, yeah. So if any of them's ever been to one of my classes, they know the answer to this one because I talk about it in my introduction, which is I love Pearl Jam. Uh, I've seen them in concert 43 times. No, 42, because the last concert I was supposed to go to right across from your house uh, Jason was canceled during the summer, unfortunately. So, yeah, but I've seen them uh, all over the world, across Europe and across the U.S. They are definitely my favorite band. I love it. And for those in the Indianapolis area, they are supposed to be coming back this summer. So yeah. supposedly they couldn't make it last year in Indy because of COVID. Um, but hopefully Eddie's feeling better and and hopefully we can get Pearl Jam back here in Indy. So love that. I'm a big fan of the a lot of the, the grunge era bands, too. So I love a Pearl Jam reference. How about this one? If there's one person that you could meet in the history of the world, who would it be? Ooh, that's a tough one, man. Oh, geez, I don't know. I, I'm I'm from Illinois, and it's the land of Lincoln. So I'm going to throw out Abraham Lincoln because he's uh, uh, seems very intelligent and very witty, and I, I like to fancy myself as maybe both of those things. At least one of them. I'm, I'm kind of witty sometimes, maybe not as intelligent, but as him. But yeah, that's. That's a, I'd say that's one of my top choices, Abraham Lincoln. How about that? Well, I love that. And, and maybe another kind of undertone to it is I would imagine I'm not a, a historian here, but Abraham Lincoln probably managed a lot of change in his presidency mm -hmm. that was going on in the country at that time, um, yeah. where he probably had some change management expertise that he yeah. was wielding to try and keep the country together. So lots of chaos and complexity. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Um, how about a hidden talent or a hidden skill that people wouldn't guess about you? Ooh, yeah. So uh, I've actually been uh, going through uh, pilot training. So starting to be a become a pilot just for fun, not not to become an airline pilot eventually, but just more for fun. Something I've always wanted to do as a kid, uh, and just either never had the money or the time or both. Uh, and so it's something I've I've uh, picked up in the last year, and it's you know slowly getting to that point where I got enough hours and things like that. But that's that's something that is a, is a, a passion of mine that I'm, I'm trying to take action on. I love that. So can Ira and I call you up anytime we're wanting to go on vacation? That's the plan. Yeah. So yeah. side business. <laughs> awesome. I dig it. I love it. That's, that's really cool. I love that. And then last one, and maybe these are related, um, but how about a favorite hobby? Would it be the flying now? Or is there another hobby of whenever you've got some downtime, this is what you're going to do to get in the zone? Yeah, my my thing is travel. I love to travel and go new places. I, I rarely go to the same place twice. Um, and so my my count of countries I've been to so far is 53. Uh, and so part of that was I, I lived internationally as a kid. And so, uh, you know, got a lot of that under my belt. By, probably by the time I was 15, I had been to more than 20 countries. 
Uh, it's a passion I've tried to pass on to my kids. So my kids are teenagers and they've, uh, they're approaching 15, 17 countries they've been to as well. So, so the, that's my passion. When, you, when I'm not home uh, and not busy with work, I, I try to go somewhere, new, some new country or some new place, even in the U.S. That's incredible. And so maybe there's an intersection there of being able to fly on your own that you'll be flying yourself all around the world one yeah, day. For sure. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Aaron, thank you so much for being with us again. This is Aaron Kopel, the founder and CEO of Project Brilliant. Aaron, before we let you go, what are some ways people can learn more about you and connect with you, but also learn more about the work you're doing at Project Brilliant? Yeah, thanks, guys. And so thanks so much, Ira, Jason. It's It's been great to be on the show. So uh, yeah, connecting with me, uh, projectbrilliant.com, of course, our website, lots of information on there uh, about our services and what we provide, training classes, coaching, and, and helping organizations become more agile. Uh, feel free to reach out to me as well. So my email address is pretty straightforward. It's Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at projectbrilliant.com. And always happy to connect on LinkedIn as well. That's a great place to find me. We, we do a lot of posts on there as well, uh, try to share some information, uh, things like that. Uh, on LinkedIn. So happy to connect there. And uh, I'm also writing a book. It's not ready yet. It'll be, uh, we're targeting probably April of 2024, but the book is called Optimize, uh, Unleashing the Full Potential of Your Organization. So of course, it's a lot about how to apply all these agile concepts to your whole organization, right? In the areas of products, teams, and leaders. And so we'll, we'll go deep into that, but that's, uh, look forward to that coming. So hopefully those are helpful and uh, some good ways to connect with me. I'm looking forward to it. So please reach out. Absolutely. And, and congratulations on the book, Aaron. That's a big accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, look forward to uh, having you back when the book comes out. Uh, and also, uh, Beth, I assume might be from your office or from your business. Uh, she said to make sure we look at um, your ebook, How to Make Agility Work for Your Business. Beautiful. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, Beth. Go up there and... <laughs> so, good, good reminder, Beth. Thanks very much, Aaron. Um, love to to continue this conversation with you, especially about uh, the AQ. Uh, might be some opportunities for, for both of us because I don't do what you do for sure. So, yeah, Thanks, guys. Take care. That one was awesome, Ira, to be able to think about agility and adaptability in different ways. What were some of the things that jumped to mind or came to you that are going to be things that stick with you from this conversation today? Well, one was, was, was really having that uh, some clarity around agility in, in my mind. I mean, I understood it, but I'm going to explain it, but understanding agility and adaptability where they fit and, and adaptability really is uh, when we look at it from the AQ side is really looking at the person and, and agility, although they are talking about the person, it really was more on that structure, the method, the process, the how to do it. Uh, there has to be a, a mindset there but it's like, okay, how do you, how do people develop that mindset? And, and again, some people grasp it and, and other people don't. And then the second was the parallels with their model as, as he was going through the model from expert to cat, achiever and, 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 and the catalyst. Uh, it, it just fits so well in, in, in the framework of that ACE model and the AQ that I talk about and, and, and really promote so much. Um, uh, of the difference between disrupting and transforming or exploring and transforming and utilizing and improving. Uh, you know, where do we get teams? What's the alignment? How, how do you know where people fit? Uh, and, and just because you have a brainstorming session or, or, or um, people are focused on growth mindset and people become open-minded, doesn't mean they're good visionaries. They, you know, they, they may have that capability, but it's not there. And, and, um, and even an incremental change is a huge step for them where other people um, like you and me that really think more on a big scale, a big picture, um, you know, those micro steps seem so insignificant, but they're not for many people. That's right. And for me, the, the, when we're talking about AI and the context of this was around how there still may be so many people that are reluctant or scared or fearful of tinkering and dabbling with AI. And when Aaron said, you're paid to think and solve problems at the end of the day, regardless of your role, your title, your position, every single person, that's what you're paid to do. And so we have to flip that mindset of we need to be leveraging and using and tinkering and experimenting with the AI to help us think better and to get better at solving problems for customers and also for the businesses that we're a part of. Um, I think that's a really great mental shift there 
and a message that needs to get out to more folks that are fearful or worrisome that somehow their employer is going to be coming after them if they start tinkering or stuff. It's like, no, if, if you're working for a good employer, they're wanting you to take that by the reins and experiment with it because those are going to be the organizations that are still around in five years. Mm -hmm. The ones that are maybe making you worried about doing it and saying, no, don't do that. Might be time to start looking for a new employer because they may not be around um, if they're not experimenting and leveraging and figuring out how to drive value with the AI. So that was a big takeaway for me. So Googleization Nation, we want to thank you again for being with us today. If you haven't liked or subscribed to the show on all of our platforms, please do so. YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify is where you can primarily find us. And um, thank you so much for being part of the show. And um, until next time, I'm Jason Cochran signing off. And I'm Ira Wolf. Thanks so much for being part of Googleization Nation as well. And until next week, don't let the shift hit your plans. Thanks for watching Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. Be sure to listen to the podcast and follow us on YouTube. This show was produced and edited by Hilton Productions.